right, well this is tagging your world with RFID, or how to annoy your friends, family, and pets, um, which is something I'm a bit of an expert on. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Atacontius. Um, you can also follow my live uh, tweet stream they're gonna have uh, that has extra information, you know, links to details about RFID tags, that sort of thing, at hashtag Ruby RFID. Um, so I work in laboratory information management software. Um, basically what we do is um, I personally track vials and robotic freezers using RFID tags. It's freaking cool. It's a lot of fun. And um, the company that I work for, JMI Laboratories, we actually test antibiotics and find out which antibiotics are developing, uh, basically bacteria is developing a resistance to. Um, we've been doing this for 15 years. Um, we pass the information off to the FDA. We pass the information off to the European Health Agency. Um, and then of course we help uh, drug companies develop better antibiotics as a side effect. Um, lots of data to sift through, it's a lot of fun. Um, and while I'm up here, um, I also kind of wanted to promote Ruby for Good. I'm sure some of you have already heard about it. Um, if you haven't, uh, you can visit rubyforgood.org. Um, also talk to Sean Marcia or talk to, um, uh, to Chris Sexton. Um, it, it's basically a weekend hackathon where you're helping nonprofits and open source. And we go out and last year we had kittens because we worked with the Humane Society. Uh, this upcoming year, uh, we're, there's gonna be red pandas. Uh, we're gonna actually be at the Smithsonian Mason uh, Research Center in Virginia, um, and it should be pretty interesting. And so a couple of personal things about me. Um, I, um, I think you'll understand what I'm doing later on with some of the hardware if you, for those that don't know me, uh, by knowing that I'm a little bit of a weird dude. I tried to bring back this 40 spin stash that did not work out. Um, I generally hike in a kilt, uh, in Crocs. Um, I was a professional chef. Um, not before IT, I quit IT, went to culinary school, became a chef, came back, because that turns out that really sucks. <laughs> I, I go to a lot of punk rock shows with my daughter, who is 18, and surprisingly not too embarrassed by me. I'm Batman. So I, I work remote. Um, one of the big reasons is because um, I have, uh, I, this is what I was known for when I worked in an office, is I was the person that did these horrible things to their office mates. But here's the thing. I didn't actually have that many coworkers, so it was mostly just this guy. <laughs> and we're still dear friends, for the most part. Um, Random factoid. So this is a this is a photo of um, outside of the uh, the plane on the way here. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely fascinating to me. Um, and I've done quite a bit of traveling, but at the age of 38, this is actually the first time I've ever been on a plane. This is also the first time I've ever spoken to a group this large. <laughs> so I figure it's a whole thing first. So let's actually move on to what is RFID. So RFID is a radio frequency identification. It's the use of wireless use of electromagnetic fields to transfer data. Um, you know, you can do this for automatically identifying and tracking tags that are attached to objects. That's kind of the Wikipedia definition there. Uh, but really no explanation of RFID or, or magnetic fields and that sort of thing is gonna be complete without talking about Tesla. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Nikolai Tesla. And, you know, Tesla was without a question the greatest geek that ever lived. And actually, if you're following that tweet stream, there's a, a link to an explanation of why he was the greatest geek to ever live. So in 1894, Nikolai Tesla used resonant inductive coupling to wirelessly light up phosphorescent and incandescent lamps. Um, resonant inductive coupling is the near field wireless transmission of electrical energy between two magnetically coupled coils. Um, Resident energy transfer is the operating principle behind passive RFID tags, which you're gonna see here today. Um, wireless charging, which I think a lot of people have probably adopted at this point, as well as contactless smart cards, which if you work in the government, I'm sure you've dealt with. Um, so thank you, Nikolai. Um, there's a lot of practical uses for RFID, um, and a lot that many people in here have already used, um, such as uh, races. 
Uh, race timing of the bibs, um, as well as shoe tags, have become very common, very popular. Um, <laughs> DVD kiosks, I don't know why I put this one here. These are going to be gone in like a year. Um, uh, authentication, doors, computer systems, medical carts. Um, this is growing more and more and more common. Um, toll collection. I'm sure that quite a few people here have Easy Pass or whatever is common down here in Texas. Um, and asset tracking. Uh, this, is, um, this is the bread and butter of the RFID industry. Um, this is what has driven prices down. You, it used to cost several dollars to buy a single RFID tag not that long ago, and now you can buy a paper tag for 13 cents on a giant roll because companies like Walmart and Best Buy and all these, these large big box stores are using it. Manufacturers are using it to track their assets. Um, it's, it's, it's easy, it's cheap, and it's starting to become more and more accessible to the rest of us, not just to those industrial purposes. And getting back to access tracking for a moment, that's what I get to do, which is really fun. Because you're like, oh, we have a bunch of files of MRSA. Um, cool, don't touch that. Um, <laughs> and actually, there's, um, uh, there's a couple other random uses um, that I wanted to mention. Um, one just wireless access points and smart dust. Um, there's a thing called the Monza X2K. It's a UHF um, RFID reader. Um, sorry, that's not it. Ignore that. Um, <laughs> that it holds about 9,000 bits. It can actually be attached to a, a, a circuit board uh, and or a microcontroller, and can be used to passively pass information to the processor, even if the device is turned off. So. Where is this getting used and how is it, why is this handy? So Microsoft is actually starting to use them in some of their tablets. And the idea is you go into the store, you purchase your product without anybody really even noticing that it's occurring, it gets activated as you're purchasing it. And a signal goes to that turned off device and lets it know this was a legitimate purchase, this is now under warranty, enjoy. However, if you take it and you try to walk out of the store with it, you'll never get to turn it on. That's kind of cool. It's also kind of scary that you can wirelessly transfer information to a turned off computer. Um, there's also a thing called smart dust, which are tiny RFID chips that are actually used to create wireless sensor networks. Um, these are starting to be used um, as neural networks to control uh, artificial robotic limbs. I mean, I mean that's, this is wild stuff. And then of course, I, th I think most people are probably familiar with RFID ear tags uh, that are common in industrial farming, um, as well as with your pets. Um, that's a fairly common use. Um, and also people. Um, they're used to track movements of personnel within a building, at doors, um, in elevators, that sort of thing. Um, which, every time I've had this conversation somewhere, of course, it's gonna, it's, it brings up that question. There's the privacy question, there's the, uh, <coughs> there's this question. So I did link the Google search to find these. It's great, it, just pages after pages of Google images. So RFID is cheap, it's becoming more and more common, but it's still not necessarily that understood by the wide populace. Um, the range for reading one of these embeddable RFID chips is centimeters, not feet, <laughs> not even inches. Um, so the, the, the concerns that you might be being tracked by RFID tags, um, are a little bit blown out of proportion. There's still certain reasons to be cautious. Um, however, the reality is, is that when you're running around with these networked computers that are getting your location from space in your pockets, I'd be a little more concerned about that. It's a lot easier. Um, but, this is a great picture. <clears throat> I, I just wanna say, if this still really is a concern for you, um, let, let, me, let me just give you some advice here. Um, do, 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 do. Oops, oh, that, that went tiny. Okay, so here we have an RFID tag. As we can see, it read, no problem whatsoever. Find yourself some tin foil. Go ahead, put on the tin foil hat. They work. <laughs> uh, uh, whoops. All right, so limitations. Um, 
there are certain disadvantages to RFID tags. Um, I'm sure that people that are aware of um, iBeacons and other kind of competing technologies, um, there, there's areas where they're just quite a bit better. Um, there's physical limitations. Uh, there's, you can't read through aluminum foil, so how are you going to attract people? Um, it's difficult to read them through liquids. Um, there are, uh, there's a thing called signal collision. Um, <laughs> so if you try to read too many tags in a single spot, things go bad. Just as if you have two readers that are trying to read the sing a single tag, it doesn't know who to communicate to. Um, this causes issues. Now, the higher end you get with your hardware, the easier, the more like collision detection there is, and the more it, it works against it. Um, and then, uh, of course, standards. Uh, for the most part, there are standards. Uh, generally, when you scan a, uh, an, FRI, an RFID tag, such as a UHF Gen 2 tag, you can look at the first three numbers um, of the tag and immediately know the manufacturer if you bought it in the US. Everywhere else is just, who knows? Um, and there are privacy concerns. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people that have been working on this, um, and one of my personal favorite are zombie tags. So zombie tags are really cool. So you go into Best Buy, Best Buy uses these, by the way, and say you buy a high-end computer. It has an RFID tag in the box that gets picked up at the front of the store. Now, you can imagine the potential security issue with that. Of there's an RFID that might be linked to a product, you leave the store, is it possible for somebody to pick that up from a distance and know that in your car is, say, a new MacBook Pro? This is a concern, and this is a concern privacy advocates have had, and I certainly have had as well. So they came up with zombie tags. So as you purchase the product, the tag is said, told, you're dead, and it no longer responds. It, it, it might actually you know, pick up a magnetic wave and it'll resonate, but it won't respond unless it gets a very specific code in which case it goes, oh sweet, I'm alive again. And of course, why would you do that? Because somebody might return it to a store and you have to add it back into your, your store ready for sale. I, I mean, they come on, that's awesome. Um, so why Ruby? And why am I just like rambling on about RFID tags and all this goofiness? Um, and tinfoil hats. So there's a bit of a lower technical debt. It, when we looked at this industry 10 years ago, it was like, you know, you got to get your electrical engineer in the room to help you, you know, write your software. It was ridiculous. There are libraries now, there are ways of accessing it. The manufacturers are getting better at this. So they're exposing APIs, they're exposing, exposing web sockets that makes a language like Ruby perfect. And in my industry personally, where I'm dealing with scientists who oftentimes already know Python, it's not that big of a jump. And you know, I can write a script for them, pass it off, and go here, enjoy, and they can change it if they need to in the future. Um, and Ruby makes me happy, it, it really does. I was a PHP dev for many, many, many years. I was dead inside. Um, <laughs> and then I found Ruby, and it, it just, it, it brings me you know, absolute joy, it really does. Um, so this is a bit of a high level overview. If you want to talk more in depth, if you want to talk about the, the frequency ranges for UHF tags versus HF versus uh, NFC tags, I'll be more than happy to tonight after Matt's talks, you know, let's grab a cup of coffee. We'll, we'll spend all the time that you want. Um, if, you, if you need something written, of course, just buy me a beer and I'll just write it for you, that's fine. Um, so let's, let's actually get to the fun part. Let's talk about the not so practical uses. So this is Betty. Uh, Betty is my dog, and the, I, I, have, I am so thankful to the RubyConf organizers for doing all this, but they did say that no, I could not bring her today. Um, so this will be Betty for this demonstration. Uh, so Betty has recently, uh, she signed up for Twitter. Um, and she's been tweeting a little bit. Um, it's difficult, no thumbs. Um, Oh God. So <laughs> this is real, okay? You know, p people go and we create goofy things and we throw them up as a demo in a talk. I have an RFID antenna by my back door and I have this software running on a Raspberry Pi because I'm a goof nut. Because I will let my dog out and then I'll go sit down and go, I'm gonna get this test to pass real quick. And then I'll go let her back in. And then like an hour goes by and I hear the scratching and she gives me that look of just, you've betrayed me. I feel terrible. I, I love my dog. She, she's absolutely wonderful. So I had to come up with um, a different solution. And 
Uh, so basically what we have here instead um, is let's go ahead and run betty.rb. I'm now watching the door for Betty. Betty around her collar, the real Betty, not this Betty, has an RFID chip. So when Betty goes outside, pretty sure that picked it up. Oh my God, you didn't do this to me, did you? Hardware talk, aren't they great? Oh then, I wrote a fail safe in there. Woof, woof, woof. Really? Yeah, that could be it, actually. This is not working. Right. Let me examine real quick. Like I said, hardware talks. Um, okay, I'm talking to it. That's fine. Uh, let's actually go back here. Let's go down the socket. Um, we'll use this. Okay, that tag works. Well. <laughs> You're dead to me. So, if Betty had not betrayed me, uh, what would have occurred, and I, I will just, I'll do a proof of concept here, we'll just go to the page where we can find this. Um, uh, she has been basically uh, tweeting me, and let me, I'm not logged in here, never mind. So she's been tweeting me, letting me know, Adam, I'm outside, please don't forget me. If you visit <laughs> that website, um, you will actually uh, visit her Twitter feed, you'll be able to see the past tweets because I'm sloppy. And uh, when I let her back in, it actually just goes ahead and it lets me know how long she's been out. Um, this is the code. If somebody notices why it doesn't work now, feel free to let me know after the fact. Uh, you know, we're, we're just basically, we're observing a web socket. That's all we're doing. And then we have a conditional there where we're looking for Betty. If we're finding Betty's RFID tag, we're performing one of two actions. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons I love Ruby. It's, it's just so quick to throw these things out and or break them. Let's move on to the internet of things. I don't, I don't like this phrase. I, I really don't. I mean, this is like, you know, such a buzzword. Everybody's into this. And, and so Julian Scheel um, on an episode of Ruby Rose was quoted as saying, why should your fridge be internet connected? He goes, because it, it could tell you that you've run out of eggs, but it probably doesn't know that you stopped eating eggs months ago. I mean, what a great point. Um, there's no reason to have a smart fridge. That's why I built a smart trash can, which will work. So, <laughs> oh my God, you better work. <laughs> so here's the idea. Oh, I'm not good at switching it as quickly. Let's go and start up my smart trash can. Thank you very much, smart trash can. And there's my smart trash, trash can. So I have just gone to the store and not deleted my test data from last night. There you go. And I have, you know, say I want to log these items. Um, so that in the future I'll know when I run out. Uh, I mean, why else would you use the smart trash can, right? Uh, whoops, there we go. All right, so I brought several items with me today. Um, this, is, this is, I mean, direct from my house. This is a representation of the things that I usually have around. Um, I have, of course, uh, some taco shells. Um, we have some uh, mason jar covers, because I can. 
egg drop soup. I had something else. Ah. Uh, ginseng tea. Love tea. Um, and uh, see so your stool softener. What? So we've scanned in our items. Um, I actually uh, I have a little API connection here that goes up, looks up the barcodes, and pulls in items. I'll show the code for that, I promise. Um, but now we've stocked our, oh, by the way, did you, does anybody notice the iPhone up there, the 4G cover? That's the taco shells? <laughs> I don't know why. I submitted a, a request to them. Um, not my problem. So as your week goes on and, and you're ready to, you know, you, you go through your food, you've taken all hundred stool softeners, that sort of thing, all you have to do is throw your items away in your smart trash can, you better work. I am not even joking. Oh, 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 no, 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 I looked at the wrong one. Look at that, there you go. So, and now we've disposed all, and now we have a shopping list. And anybody can view the list from a web browser. Your loved ones can be out shopping and go, oh, he had that stool softener problem again. And they can just go ahead and pick them up. Which that's, that's what loved ones are for. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've never talked to a loved before. So, that was the trash can demo. Um, it was uh, actually the, the code for it's very simple. Once again, I'm just listening to a WebSocket and uh, performing an action in uh, Active Record and uh, also hitting this weird, funky API that I found someplace um, that apparently doesn't work completely. Uh, somebody pointed out to me when I had actually discussed this that if you want to take this a step further, you could actually get RFID bracelets give them to people and find out who's the most wasteful in your house because there's no better way to win over your family than by tagging them and then harassing them. <laughs> so there, there's lots of other things and, uh, that you can do with RFID. Um, personally for me, I, I'm not the best dresser and uh, I've been accused of playing golf um, because of my bad choices. So I want to come out of with a better way to deal with this. Uh, so I have an RFID scanner um, in my bedroom, because I'm that guy, and it's a fashion portal. Um, <laughs> once again, very simple, we're observing a web socket. Um, I, I'm actually not going to, I'm actually missing the original portal I was gonna bring, so I'm not gonna bother with the twice in a row situation, but we are going to discuss kind of a pick-me-up, how to deal with your special clothes for special occasions, which I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I live a very rich fantasy life. And, you know, I, I personally, I enjoy being entertained and I enjoy it when I can get like, you know, put into an excellent, Mood, uh, mood first thing in the morning. So I have a list of clothing. They're rated based on different uses, and, you know, tuxedo, lab coat. Um, and so basically the end result of this, let me actually get off of this now. I'm gonna switch this again. is when I get up in the morning and I grab my clothes and I have a special purpose, I am gonna get psyched up about it. So, like I said, I work for a lab. You go and you put on your lab coat. Science! I mean, you know you're gonna kick ass that day. <laughs> when you're walking out like that, and to say, you know, you get off and you have maybe an event after <laughs> 
I really thought I had cut those down a little bit, sorry. <laughs> um, Hawaiian shirt, Evan, you wanna go ahead and guess what this was gonna do? Yeah. I will do one more and then I will stop beating on this dead horse. Because I, it entertains, I was up in the hotel room like all weekend just playing and having fun with it. And my last one was, I know that this tie looks good. Good lord. Once again, simple. Same pattern, we're listening to a web socket. Um, I have been, like I said, there's been uh, some information tweeted out because there's a lot of different devices out there. You can get RFID readers um, now that are uh, $200 range. Um, not this setup, <laughs> but you can get cheap working RFID readers um, on Alibaba, several other sources, um, and uh, like I said before, one of the things I didn't cover is I didn't cover writing. I would love to talk to, to anybody that's interested in that. I did not talk about uh, password locking, kill commands, didn't cover any of that because the reality is, is RFID has its own conferences. It's a huge topic um, and it's just too much to go into. But what I want to do is I want to spark your imagination. This language, the, the happiness that comes with it, um, the, I think you can spark creativity. And I think it gives us an opportunity to, you know, instead of beating our heads against the wall, we can, we can explore and we can have fun and we can entertain ourselves when we get up in the morning. Um, so I'm hoping that what everybody takes away from this is that they, they kind of see there's all this stuff out there that you can go play with and you can make anything that you want. Um, however, I do realize, I said this was about harassing I'm sorry, not harassing, that's horrible. Um, this was about uh, annoying your pets and your family and your loved ones. Now, okay, well, admittedly, having this music playing, you know, that annoys your, your loved ones at home. The pets, <laughs> I don't choose dead to me. Um, but what about your friends? So I wanna tell you a story and I actually wanna invite you to explore some of the possibilities here a little bit more. This is Dana. Dana Scully. Don't, don't look at me, I didn't name it. This is Coraline Ada M. Key's teddy bear that she brought with her from Chicago. Dana's missing, by the way. So if, if after Matt's talk, if, if anybody wants a little something to do and you're not leaving tonight, um, this is your starter card, Coraline. Grab some people. I'll give you this barcode scanner. As you reveal the correct RFID tags, it will give you the next clue. I hope, for your sake, that you get them all. <laughs> so I think with that, and, and everyone heard that threat, I, I think that's uh, it. So. Uh, Thank you for letting me talk. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Does anybody want a foil hat? Um, it depends on the kinds of tags. Um, the higher end tags have you know, like a 0.01% failure rate. Uh, these type of tags, uh, the paper ones like a place on my head, uh, probably somewhere in the 85% range. Uh, so generally speaking, what you do is you would load these into like a, uh, let's see, Brady makes a, an RFID printer. You start printing the spool, it'll read the tag first, write a corresponding barcode to the tag, verify that it operates, and continue printing out. Otherwise, you can black it out, and you know the tag's bad, and you just don't use it. Um, no, I am, yeah, the, the, it's NFC, um, so it's in a different range than I've been uh, showing up here. Um, uh, uh, NFC is really interesting, but you know, it has a range of a few inches. Um, I can actually 
the tag that's in Betty, who's dead to me, um, can be read from about 30 feet away with this equipment, in theory, I guess not, or not. Um, so there's a big difference there. Um, but yeah, NFC is great. I mean, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with it and definitely a lot of fun. If you have an Android phone, it's even more fun, so. Those, I'm sorry, are those? Oh, those are tiles, those are iBeacons. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Talk, talk to Chris Sexton. <laughs> oh, um, the antennas are like 300 each and the reader itself is 15 to 1600. Yeah, this, this is industrial equipment, this is not home equipment. Um, so I should like cover that. There is, there is cheaper you know, play equipment out there. And in fact, actually, if you have a, a Raspberry Pi or Arduino or something of that nature, there are now UHF uh, Gen 2 uh, 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 shields that you can get for them, um, which is like 50 bucks, which is a little cheaper. They can take a bit of a beating. Uh, most of that comes down to the casing. So one of the things that you find with RFID is things like antenna shape um, play a big role, um, which limits how you can package them. Um, you can't mount them to metal as well. So they usually have to be, they're usually backed on paper or they're backed on paper that is then sealed inside of plastic. Uh, Betty's, oh, okay, she really is going. Um, uh, so Betty is wearing a fireproof, RFID tag, and as well as the real Betty, because I, I don't know why. Um, that, I mean, they, they put them on steel beams in case they get crushed, they'll survive. Um, I mean, they're used to like, they're usually used in industrial applications where you might see a construction site, piles and piles and piles of beams everywhere. They put RFID tags on them. And they'll go through and they'll read a pile and they'll know exactly what they have and they'll have the GPS coordinates for it and now they have their inventory. Um, so they have to take a beating. And those tags in particular last, I think they're guaranteed to last 20 years, but I, I would suspect they'd probably at least last 50. So yeah, when, so when several tags are trying to respond at the same time, um, you're gonna get a signal collision. Um, generally it comes down to the reader, uh, gets to deal with that. Um, industrial readers like this, I can read about 100 tags at a time uh, within a span of, well, I don't know, like 500 milliseconds um, with, lower end, like, you know, hobbyist type readers, you might be able to read five at a time. And it's all about sorting through that. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like packet collision, you know, similar concept. Um, and the other side of that, if it's caused from two readers reading the same tag, you just screwed up the placement of the readers. You're, you're gonna have to figure that out. Uh, yes and no. So, uh, uh, so a, a tag can only respond to one antenna at a time. Um, so, Generally what you do, actually here's a great, you'll probably enjoy this. So we, a company I worked for, um, we had actually wired up a do anti-doping lab um, in the Middle East. And what we did was we put RFID readers, um, which were, they were a, um, a very low range reader, um, into carts. And in the ceilings, like every six feet, more readers and antennas. And then when the athletes would come in and they would give their urine sample, it was sealed in a, a glass container that had an RFID chip built into it. So now as it would move through the doping lab, they saw who had it because they had a tag. They saw what cart it was on. They saw which floor, which room, because as you would pass each tag, it would just take a log of it. The only way that you would know though which direction it was going is because the previous reader had read it. So this becomes kind of the issue. And, and because you can't read it with two different ones, you have to, you have to play with location and and, and worry a little bit about that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the exact kind of project that it's, it's becoming more and more common for. All right, I think we're good. All right, well, once again, thank you, everyone.